think most days my request is, Jason, that would be today. Because that day brings anything better that we can experience here and now. If you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 27, come to the second to the last chapter, and Lord willing, the second to the last sermon in Acts. It sounded kind of funny. I've enjoyed Acts. I hope you've enjoyed Acts, but we are winding this down. We're going to cover the entire chapter uh, this morning, Lord willing. Before we do that, let's ask the Lord to be with us and guide us in his word. Our Father, my prayer is that we would always have one eye to the heavens and truly be singing in our heart that soon and very soon we will be with you. And that day will be the most wonderful day of our lives. Father, you give us many foretastes, glimpses, pleasures, and delights in this world, but they are not end in themselves. They are just a little preview of what awaits. And may we be men and women who do not fall in love with this world, who do not get caught up in this world, but recognize that our glory waits the next age. Father, as we study this morning of your servant who had that, who had that perspective, who understood that this life did not offer ultimate fulfillment, may we be challenged by him, may we be encouraged by him, and above all, may we look to the same God to whom he looked to persevere in the storm of life, waiting for that day. We pray this for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to chapter 27 of Acts, we find a very detailed account of this storm and Paul and these other men surviving this storm. And as you look at all of the content of the book of Acts, as you look at all of the things Luke could have recorded for us, we may stop and ask the question, why does he spend so much time on this event? And I think we'll see as we go, maybe, why he did that. This is a, a very important uh, chapter because even non-believing historians and uh, scientists have looked at this and said this is an extremely accurate picture of how they uh, lived at sea in that period of time. Luke is regarded, even by secular scholars, as a precise and accurate historian with respect to these things. Now, our resident uh, naval expert, Bob Miller, probably will say there could have been improvements in how they handled uh, seafaring ways then. But for this time, this is how they did things, and we're going to see this as we go through. So let's dive right into Acts 27, beginning in verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Andromedian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for many days, for good many days, and with difficulty had arrived at Canidus, since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmon. And with difficulty passing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lassia. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the naval and, and uh, 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 what's the word? Sailing, thank you. That's my helpmate right there. Sailing uh, details here. But I want to point out kind of the bigger picture of the story as we go. First of all, notice the first person plural, we. Luke has rejoined Paul, and we don't know who else is with him other than Aristarchus, but he's got a few loyal friends. 
That is loyalty. They're on a ship on the way to Italy. They don't know what awaits them in Italy, except that Paul is going to stand before Caesar and be judged. And these other prisoners that are along the way with them, these probably were not nice, polite, gentle criminals. Most likely, these guys were on their way, at least some of them, on their way to fight as sport in the Colosseum to their death. That's what they did with prisoners back then. So this has been a rough, a rough group of people on this grain ship. Egypt was a grain capital at that time, and eventually they get on this grain ship and head toward Rome. Paul and Luke and Aristarchus and the rest are on their way here, and notice that the, the centurion already likes Paul. He lets him off for a while to go be cared for by his friends. This was a big risk for the centurion. If Paul escapes, the centurion takes his place and is condemned on behalf of Paul. But he's already, Paul has already won his favor, won his, his, his liking, and he lets him go for a while to receive care. It may be that's what, what is being communicated with that is that Paul was sick, and he went and received medical attention. Comes back to the ship, and now the winds and the waves are contrary, and they get back on. Verse 9. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. So Paul, the Luke tells us here the fast was already over. This was Yom Kippur. This was the Day of Atonement, which happened either at the end of September or the early part of October. In the Mediterranean Sea at this time, they shut down sailing from November through at least January because the waters were so treacherous and the tempests were so severe that you were not going to make it across the sea. And this was late September or early October. Already, a lot of ships would would delay until springtime because of the intensity. And Paul stands up and says, I think we ought to wait this out. I perceive that we're not going to make it. He does this because Paul's been at sea quite a bit in his life. Do you remember when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, I've spent three days, uh, I've been shipwrecked rather three times, and I've spent a whole night and day in the deep. Uh, Estimates are that he spent maybe 3,500 miles on sea during his missionary journeys. He knew something about travel, and he said, it's getting late in the year, it's not safe, we should just harbor here for the winter. And the centurion, who obviously liked Paul, said, I'm going to go with the pilot and the captain on this one, thank you very much, and proceeded to sail on anyway. And they get a favorable wind, everything's fine, until verse 14. But before long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called Uroquilo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, We gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they drew the ships, threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands, since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. This severe storm that blew in is what they called a northeaster. This was a big one. This was a massive storm. Uh, one of the Greek words translated is the word we get the, the word 
typhoon from. This is basically a hurricane in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and this little ship is being tossed to and fro here and there, and they're convinced they're going to capsize. They start throwing stuff overboard. They throw their tackle overboard. They bring in the little boat that they would use to go in and out of the harbor with inside. Usually it would drag along behind the boat, but they brought it in because if they lost that, they wouldn't have the, uh, the, the little shuttle to get back and forth with, and all hope is lost. Luke tells us, he includes himself, the word our there in verse 20, From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Here's a ship full of 276 men, as we will learn, and they've said, we're done. We're going to die in this storm. That is all except one man had lost hope. Verse 21. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, I told you so. You ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. It's being a little facetious there. I don't really think that was Paul's attitude. I don't think he was using this as a great I told you so moment. I think he was reminding them that he did predict this, and they should now listen to what he's going to say, because what he's going to say now is also worth hearing, but all the more so because it's not just coming from his sailing experience. He's actually heard from the God who controls these storms. And the God who is, and the God who's in providential sovereign control, sent his angel to me, and he said, you must reach Rome and stand before Caesar, and I have given you, Paul... All of the men on the ship, not a single hair on their head will perish. They will be safe through the storm. So Paul says twice, take courage, take heart. It's going to be okay. We are going to run the ground. The ship will be lost. All of our cargo will be lost. All the grain will be lost, but our lives will be spared. I've heard from God. You can trust me on this one. Verse 27, but when the 14th night came, As we were being driven out in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, and a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. nothing. Therefore, I encourage you, take some food, for this is your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish." Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. When day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind, they were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention, and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. The rest would follow, some on planks, others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. 
So they're being tossed around, and Paul shows up and says, eat, men. We're going to be okay. You haven't eaten anything for two weeks. You are weak. You need to take something. And he broke bread and gave thanks. This is not a communion service. This is not Lord's Supper. This is a common expression for meals together. He broke the bread, and he gave thanks to his God, bearing witness to God to all of these men. And they ate, and they were encouraged, and they gained strength, and sure enough, they ran aground. This, uh, this little bit about the, uh, the men who were trying to escape, and Paul saying to them, unless these men stay on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. He's saying, look, we need these guys to finish the task, to, to control the ship until we finally get where we're going. Don't let them get out of that little boat. It would have been their death anyway. That little boat would have, would have been capsized in a heartbeat out there, and they all stayed. They cut the boat loose, and all men stayed. I love that because here we have God's sovereignty and man's responsibility side by side without any desire on Paul's part or anybody else's to reconcile them. God has already said they will all be spared. Paul says if these guys get off the boat, they'll die. And we'll all die. We can't survive if these guys get off. There's no apology. There's, there's no question about, if, is God really in control? Did he mean what he said? God has determined this. You have your part. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is God who is at work to will and to do. They're both always true. God is sovereign. We must do our part in life. And the Bible never calls us to try to make sense of those things in a way that satisfies our curiosity. And you know why that is? Because we're infinite, I mean, we're finite human beings trying to grapple with the infinite sovereignty of God. We're not ever going to be able to reconcile those things enough to satisfy our curiosity. Now, as I was reading this this week and pondering this, I kept thinking over and over and over again, this, makes a, this would make a great movie. When it's, I mean, this is, this, there's the drama in this text, the events. I, I kept picturing uh, images and scenes from The Perfect Storm, if you've seen that movie, where, of course, at the end, they all die, and here they all survive. So it's not a perfect image of The Perfect Storm. But it, it, it would be a great movie. So, Todd, get your movie-making skills going, and let's make a movie on this. All of this, there's so much we could draw out of here, but, but here's, what, here's what centers in my mind. There is an application that for a preacher just kind of screams out. It's almost in bold. If you give two seconds of thought, you'll probably see it as well. Verse 20 says, at the end, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. They've given up. The storm is too severe. There's no reason to expect anything but certain destruction. Then a prophet of God stands up and says, everything's going to be okay because God had spoken to him. And then the last verse is, and so it happened, they were all brought safely to land. And the application point that just sort of screams at me is, we can trust God in the storm. Even at that point, maybe especially at that point when we think, all hope is lost. I have, I have no reason to think anything but destruction is coming. At that moment, I need to cling to the Lord and trust that he will see me safely to the end. And I think that's true so long as we define the end the same way that God does. The temptation is to grab a story like this and say to our brothers and sisters who are struggling with severe consequences and circumstances, saying, look, you're going to have a couple of weeks where you're not going to see the sun, you're not going to see the stars, it's going to be cloudy, you're going to be depressed and sad, but after a couple of weeks, the sun's going to break through again, the seas are going to calm, and it's going to be okay. That's not the story of the Bible. In fact, what we are told very specific, specifically is it's the next earth that has no pain and no sorrow and no suffering and no death. This age, this earth, this period of time is, we are promised pain and sorrow and suffering and death. And sometimes we want what is awaiting us to happen now, and we grow impatient, and we begin to shake our fist at God and say, why aren't you doing things differently? 
Hey, look, you saved Paul. Why aren't you bringing the sunshine? I've had enough of the clouds and the storms. And we forget, no, 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 we don't get the promise of that bliss until the next age and the next earth. Think of chapter 12 of Acts that we looked at some months ago. James, the Apostle James, a servant of Christ James, proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ James, Herod had him beheaded. God didn't spare him from the storm. He died. Same chapter, Peter is thrown in prison. Herod finds out the Jews like the fact that he beheaded James, so he's going to go after Peter. God sends his angel to rescue Peter. He gets out alive. What's the difference? Hardly are we going to say that Peter was more righteous than James. I mean, we don't have a lot of information about how James was, but we've got plenty on Peter to know he was not the paragon of virtue through the early part of his ministry, at least. It's not about better people. It's about God's purposes and plans. He was not yet done with Peter. He had a, a calling for Peter. Think about Paul. He is saved from this storm. He and all these men are rescued. They make it safely to Rome. And there does he go and live happily ever after? No, he's on his way to being put to death for the sake of Jesus Christ. This storm is not going to end Paul's life, but there's one that's coming that will. God will see us safely to the end, but the end is his end according to his purposes. We oftentimes, I think, at least I struggle with this, sometimes want to, 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 to see heaven on earth when that's not. It's heaven in heaven, not the here and now. It's his plan, his purposes that matter, not our own. And the key, I'm convinced, as to why he was able to withstand whatever Christ led his way is found in verse 23. As Paul is describing the appearance of the angel, notice what he says. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong. That's not the angel it's God. I belong to God, he says. You have belongings. You've heard the expression, pack up your, your belongings, grab your belongings, gather your belongings. Belongings are things that you own. I have a car. It's my car. And I can do with my car what I want to do with my car. I could put ugly orange and yellow stripes, you know, racing stripes on it if I want. I can jack it up and put wheels bigger than I am on it if I want. It's my car. I can drive it where I want to. I can drive it as fast as I want to. Well, I guess that's not exactly true. But it's, it's my car. It belongs to me. It's my possession. It's my property. And I talk in terms of owning the car. And you have your possessions as well. That is the language Paul is using here. I am owned by God. Because I am owned by God, he can do with me whatever he wants. He can put big, ugly racing stripes on my side if he wants. And he can lead me into the perfect storm if he wants and take my life that way. Paul talked in these terms frequently in the Bible. This was common fare for him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he said it this way. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You don't own you, and I don't own me. For you have been bought with a price. God bought us with the blood of Jesus Christ and we now belong to him. He said something very similar in Romans chapter 14. I can't find it, I'll read it up there. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now I want you to notice 
the last word, lords, that apostrophe S, that in English is how we signify possession. Whether you live, whether you die, you are owned by Jesus. He purchased us with his blood. He went to the cross so that he could receive us and have us and own us. We're always owned. You were born into this world owned. We're not free. We talk about being the, the land of the free and the home of the brave, but we're not. We're not independent individuals able to do whatever we want to. We are owned by our flesh. We're owned by sin. We're owned by Satan. We're in the kingdom of darkness as we come into this world. And we will remain under the control and ownership of the evil one until Christ purchases us. And then when he does, the ownership, the title deed to our lives are transferred to Jesus. And now he owns us. But we are never our own. We're his. And he has the right with his property to do whatever he wants to do. Now, this is good news because our owner is a benevolent owner. He's a good owner, a gracious owner. He gave himself up for us. How will he not also freely give us all things, Paul says? He is working all things together for our good. Even when he chooses to bring us through the valley of the shadow of death, he goes there with us, sees us through it to whatever end he is determined. Either we do get to the other side, to the mountaintop again in the here and now, or he takes us to our eternal home. Either way, he's doing what is for our good and for his glory. But we must reconcile ourselves to the fact that our lives are not our lives. My car is not really my car. It's Jesus' car. And our time is not really our time. Sometimes we, we talk about, I need my time. I just need time for me. You don't ever get time for you. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, okay, I want this much and the rest of it's all yours. You can spend your time on whatever you want. He doesn't tell us that. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you this much money, and as long as you give me 10% on Sunday mornings, you can spend the other 90% however you want to. It's all his. He owns you. Literally, in the most ultimate sense, he owns you and me, and our money, our time, our relationships, our spouses, our children, our jobs— our college careers, everything in our lives belong to Jesus Christ. And we only become depressed and despairing when we lose something, when we've clung so tightly to it, saying, this is mine. If we live our lives saying, none of it's mine, it's all his, and he chooses to take it away, we let go easily because he owns it. It's his to do with as he pleases. I'm convinced that is what enabled the Apostle Paul to endure all things. When he says, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he's given himself to Christ. He's accepted the fact that Christ is his owner. And whatever he brings me through, he will draw strength from Christ and be devoted to Christ and persevere in Christ to do what Christ is called to do. And he says to these men, I am owned by God. Next phrase is, whom I serve. It's the only right response to your Savior, to your owner, to your king to say, I will serve you with every breath. I will serve you with every dollar. I will serve you with every minute. I'm yours. Take it. Do what you want with my life. This is what he means in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I know you know these verses. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your, and the NAS here has spiritual service of worship. The word is logikos. I think it's really more along the lines of logical or rational, or reasonable. What he's saying is, after all these mercies I've just presented to you in the first 11 chapters of Romans, the gospel and God's grace in sending his son to the cross, justifying us, giving us new life in Christ, and on and on and on, election and, and all these things. By all of these mercies, I urge you to present your bodies, give your bodies, give yourselves 
a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, this is the only rational, reasonable response to the grace of God. It's to say, I deserve hell. You have given me eternal life. What else can I do? What, what is more rational than saying, my existence is now yours? I give it to you in service, in worship to you. Paul got that. And that's why he's able to have a snack as the ship is being tossed side to side and water is caving in. It's like, take courage, guys. God who owns me and whom I serve He's told me, I've got to get to Rome and serve him there and preach to Caesar. So eat. We're going to be okay. Yeah, it's going to be ugly because we're going to ram into some reef or something and we're going to have to swim for our lives, but we're going to keep our lives all the way to shore because my God has told me so. Take courage, men. We're going to make it. This is why... I constantly encourage us as we're praying, for instance, for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are in harm's way, Pastor Youssef, who Brother Nate brings before us frequently, and others, when we pray for missionaries who may be called upon to give their lives for the gospel, it shouldn't be our first request that God would deliver them from their captors. That should not be our first concern. Yes, we should pray for them. I believe the early church was praying for Peter to be released from prison. But our first prayer request should be that they will be faithful to Christ in the midst of persecution. That they would have the mindset like the apostles where they would be beaten and persecuted and, and, score, and, and uh, flogged. No, scourged, thank you. It's not firing on all cylinders here. And walk away from that event bloody and, and rejoicing that they would be counted worthy to suffer, even to die for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. That should be our first concern. Paul said, pray that I would be bold when I march into Rome and preach the gospel there so that I will be faithful to Christ no matter what comes. That should be at the top of our list as we're praying for our brothers and sisters who are in harm's way and the top of our list in praying for each other, that we would be bold to preach Christ, to live for Christ as we receive mockery and scorning and, and the ridicule of our, of our colleagues and, and co-citizens, that we would be faithful. So the bottom line is this. Here's what I want to draw from chapter 27. There's so many things we can get into. God's providence is so clearly displayed here. But what I want us to draw from this is, when God brings us through such a storm, and when it gets desperate, and when we come to verse 20 and say, all hope of being saved is abandoned in my heart, that we would not have as our highest priority for ourselves to pray that we will be saved from the storm but that we will be faithful to our Lord in it, whether he brings death or rescue. That we would die for him if that's what he calls us for, to do. That we will live for him if he brings us salvation. But either way, our greatest concern is to please him through the storm. Brother Todd, come lead us in praying that today.